Hi, it's Ken Burns. Uh, for our series of Unum Chats, focused on Leonardo da Vinci, I am thrilled to speak today with Dr. Atu Gawande, a renowned surgeon, writer, and public health leader. He currently serves as the Assistant Administrator for Global Health at USAID. Prior to that, he was a practicing general and endocrine surgeon at Brigham and William Women's Hospital in Boston and professor at Harvard Medical School. As if that wasn't enough, you might also be familiar with his four, count them four, New York Times bestselling books, particularly the incredible to me being mortal. Welcome, Dr. Gawande, to our Unum chat. It's such a pleasure and honor to have you. Great pleasure to, to meet you and uh, and talk to you. Great. Well, we're going to start off by watching a short clip from our film on Leonardo da Vinci. This clip is from the second part of our two-part film uh, later in Leonardo's life. And to sort of set the scene, his workshop is now in a villa outside of Milan. He's been in Florence. He's been in Milan. He's been forced out of Milan. He's been to Rome. He's been various places. Uh, there he continues his research into a variety of his interests, uh, particularly in human anatomy, which has fascinated him for years and years. So let's play the clip and I'll get your reaction to it on the other side. At Villa Melzi, Leonardo had also returned to his anatomical studies, dissecting ox hearts to determine how blood flows through their chambers and valves. He now recognized that rather than having two chambers, as anatomists had believed since the second century, the human heart had four. Marvelous instrument invented by the supreme master, he had written below a drawing. He came up with this totally accurate idea that the valves begin to close while the blood's still flowing through them. And he translates that along with other knowledge to say, well, look, that's what must happen to the blood. It must form these vortices. And the vortex which is forming as the blood is still flowing out of the heart is actually unfurling the leaflets so they can close in perfect harmony. And then he challenges himself, well, what if I'm wrong? What happens then? He then designed an experiment to demonstrate how this happens. He writes notes to himself that how to actually pour hot wax inside the calf heart and then use that wax model to make a glass model out of it and buy some uh, silk fabrics and cut it to the shape of the leaflets of the heart of the calf. And, you know, sew it together and then put together perhaps the first, you know, synthetic heart valve ever. Then he uses water and a hand pump and use grass seeds to do visualization, basically watching how the flow pattern forms every time the heart valve opened or closed. The first ever drawing of a synthetic heart valve, which is exactly like heart valves we use today, tissue valves, but he didn't stop there. He went on and he described why the aortic valve, pulmonary valve, had to have three leaflets, not two, not four, through geometric proof, beautiful geometric proof. It would be more than 450 years before scientists, using modern imaging techniques, proved Leonardo's theory correct. Why? Why did he, why did he do this? First of all, there's no use for it. There's no cardiac surgery, there's no cardiology, you couldn't do anything with it. So it wasn't of any use to anybody. It was purely understanding for understanding's sake. Well, thank you uh, for watching that. I just, what, what did you think? I'd love to just start off with your reaction to that short clip. He was such an incredible scientist. He was someone who just thought unlike people in his time. You know, in that era, people were not probing at this level of depth, this level of curiosity, and this level of fearlessness. I mean, he's dissecting not just a calf heart, he's dissecting people's bodies and unpacking uh, a, a deep understanding of what is happening. That example is just one of many, many examples. He discovers the structures of the brain and the, and the ventricles of the brain and the spinal system. I mean, the, over and over and over again, He's doing this at, at, at extraordinary depth. Uh, Dr. Wells in the film describes Leonardo's research into heart valves as understanding for understanding's sake. And since cardiology didn't even exist, as he points out at the time, you know, how would you describe 
what's going on right now? Are we so imprisoned by specialism? Are we able to get to the place where we're working purely at a theoretical or investigative or just sheer curiosity sake, uh, rather than the physical or the practical or the applied? What's, what's happening now uh, in the cutting edge of medical research today? Are, are people... Do we have anybody that approaches the kind of free thinker that, that Leonardo was, of course, without the benefit of a telescope, with, of course, without the benefit of a microscope, but his own eyes and received wisdom that has been incorrect for millennia and suddenly is able to, to do something which only 500 years later do we realize he was absolutely right? We, we do. I mean, the, the incredible thing about our current era is that you don't just have to just don't rely on rich philanthropists. <laughs> we have our version of those today who are benefactors to the arts and the sciences and allow for wide ranging free thinking out of just curiosity. But we have entire institutes, right? We have the National Institutes of Health where people are investigating the structure of, of, of humanity, the structure of biological existence. We have uh, the National Science Foundation. So, so through these, we have hundreds of thousands of people getting to be Leonardo's uh, really discovering and focusing on, uh, on an incredible range of things. And, and that has caused the pace of incredible progress. It's part of the frustration uh, of Leonardo. So, so brilliant, so amazing, had all of these insights, and he never published them. They all sat in his codex. Um, and he you know, 450 years of knowledge that could have been unpacked earlier. Um, it would have been incredible had he had a kind of amanuensis, uh, someone to turn the uh, uh, discoveries as he's making them and his own codex books into something that the rest of the world could have learned from. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. There's something sort of frustrating in that. And, and though he might have run afoul of the church had he published a lot of these things, and often the church was the sponsor. There's something so incredible to me that he saw no distinction between the works that he was doing. That is to say, I would venture to say that the Mona Lisa is a great work of anatomy. In fact, one of the exultant reviews that came later on is that someone was in the midst of describing the face, but then dropped down to the neck and said, I'm certain that I can see the pulse and I can see the flow of blood uh, in the veins of, of her neck. And it, it it's magnificent. And so too, these scientific or so-called scientific drawings are, are complete works of art. Um, and it will be centuries before people will do it, but he's way ahead of Galileo and Newton. And in sometimes employing things like calculus that didn't exist or, or having to reach um, conclusions that only calculus would have been able to bring us to and that the fact that he didn't have it makes him stunning to me in that regard. Yes. You know, here's the the part that I wonder if we have today. He was the artist combined with the scientist who was following his curiosity everywhere. And that refusal to be either or. He was an artist who wanted to understand how the muscles lay on the bones and then the the capillaries fed into the skin and the and therefore you understand how not only the contours of the skin but how it colors and how it changes with their motion and then depict that and that was to make him a better artist but the art helped him be a better scientist right. and they fed into each other in a way that that um uh you know you I don't know with the, that I can think of an example of, of people who currently exist can follow that scope. And really, we have the scientists who will follow the curiosity. We have the artists who will um, push the boundaries. But the artist scientist who will make discoveries in both realms, who will shape the standard that way, um, that extraordinary ability is... Um, uh, I bet there are corners that that exist in that way, but with the kind of impact and influence that he could demonstrate, I don't know an, a modern example of that. 
this is the first time that we've ever pursued a subject outside of the history of the United States. And one of the reasons is because he is just so sui generis and you realize that he's inheriting a, 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 a Western Greek and Roman tradition that's more observational, but he's adding experimentation, which is more from the Muslim world at the time. And he's coming to these conclusions. Um, I'm, I'm just you know, find, you know, figuring out that there are four chambers and not only that, how the valves work and the precision of that. Um, I, I don't think there's anybody, I, I know there, there's great medical exploration, but I don't think we see in one person, as you're describing, this sort of combination of all of these interests. And for him, I think the divisions of labor are inseparable. He would, if he were here, he would not be talking about any difference between an artist and a scientist. No, and and um, and I think we have, you know, we have people who want to aspire to that. There are incredible scientists who can turn their own scientific work into objects of beauty. You see it in photography of um, of science and cells and molecular um, observations, and in space and from you know the um, uh, the different telescopes now floating around the universe, helping us understand more about space and yet to have shaped our imagination our understanding of what's possible through art as well as what's possible through understanding of science it's incredible you're a renaissance man yourself and as a surgeon and an author and now a government official and administrator can you talk about your career and the integration of these seemingly to most of us disparate uh, sort of uh, dialectics and and where you find inspiration in your pursuits and how they might affect other aspects uh, of your life. Is there cross-pollination? Are you able to integrate this stuff? Do you feel in a way as if Leonardo is a source of inspiration and possibility and not just awe that here's somebody using 75% of his brain while the rest of us are are sort of scraping it along at about 10%? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to call him a source of possibility, but he is a source of permission uh, and, and sparks imagination. I... Um, my career was born, you know, I was born the child of two Indian immigrant doctors and that pathway was clear possibility <laughs> for me. And in many ways I resisted it. Um, but I was very at home in the, in the sciences and, uh, and wanting to work with people and solve problems. Um, but for whatever reason, there was part of me attracted to people in the arts world. Um, when I got married in my twenties, uh, four out of my six groomsmen were writers and I had never written before. In fact, one of them was the one who persuaded me to begin to start writing. I, I might have been born in some way to do science and public health and 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 that line of work and, and do surgery. That was a very natural pathway um, and, and in the family, so to speak. I was not a born writer. I had my, uh, I, in college, my worst grade was in writing. Um, I uh, took writing classes because there was a girl, um, in, in the, uh, fiction writing class that, um, I was particularly interested in. We're now married. <laughs> We've been together, uh, since, uh, this will be the 40th year. And, um, and the, uh, and, and I thought she would have been the one and she became an editor and, and, and is a source of inspiration and connection to the arts, uh, for me. And, you know, I'm, I'm a nonfiction writer creative nonfiction is the closest I get to capturing a little bit of what uh, um, some artists want to do. And it's fantastic. I found an audience, but, you know, as my editor said, promise me, you won't write fiction. <laughs> the, the ability to get into the imagination of impossible worlds, impossible uh, uh, objects and ideas and, uh, and throw them together uh, I, I struggle with the reality of something of the of what might have happened in the world, the million ways you can tell that story, then thinking about millions of possibilities and 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 finding a pathway through where you actually get anything done um, <laughs> in being creative uh, in, a, in a fictional world. That's what he managed to be. I mean, the other part of him that's incredibly frustrating is that he didn't get so much done. He, he, there were these series of masterpieces that came out. Um, 
he could tolerate not being, uh, uh, you know, the productive machine. I, I agree completely. I, I think it's always interesting, stunning for our audiences to understand that when you say how many paintings does Leonardo have, it's fewer than 20. And how many of them are finished? It's fewer than 10. And yet we have all of these thousands and thousands of pages of his diaries, the Codex, and with these remarkable drawings and sketches and inventions and and ideas. Um, Days I, on end, just, just trying to capture the swirl of a, of, of water out of a pipe. Of an eddy like, of water. Thing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And doing this as a lefty who's writing backwards in a mirror script, which begins to tell you that each one of those pages is in itself some extraordinary imposed discipline that none of us would have sort of the ability to to replicate. And he's still as open and as curious and as inventive uh, as you could imagine. But I, I, I understand your fiction dilemma. I'm, I'm in the business of telling true stories uh, as much as I can get at them. Is there a way in which your scientific training has served you in that regard? Uh, the mysteries, the unknowns, the things that are part of of our our systems that aren't binary. We insist on imposing these binary systems when, as nature shows us, very few things are are that way. Yes, but what I would be what I'm struck by is how much the effort at um, I, I hesitate to call myself an artist, but to create something new every time on the page feeds into my work in science and in medicine and in public health. So I'm often running into problems in 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 the real world of practicing and and doing the various things i do which puzzle me um it might be you know a case of a woman who had such a horrendous itch that um as i was reading in a journal uh, she scratched through her own skull and injured her own brain now why how does that happen what 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 uh, what is itching what's the nature of of uh, what does that tell us about sensation? That um, uh, that I could go interview her, find out her story, make the connections and have an excuse because I'm a writer to talk to scientists about the different theories of perception and then write a piece around that that I can also use to make you really itchy. Like one of my goals in that piece was to <laughs> make you want to scratch as well. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that... Um, now I can take on subjects like that that probe different kinds of questions, but then other times I might be asking, why does medicine cost so much? Or, you know, why have we uh, not eliminated polio entirely in the world yet? And those then, that exploration, uh, getting to ask people questions, think about how to tell the story, how to grab people, um, and uh, remove some of my own confusion leads to sometimes my saying, oh, I've laid out a possible pathway here out of the story. Now let me try to take that in the real world. Let me test this hypothesis. I'm running a research center here now running a, a global health uh, bureau where I lead all foreign assistance. Um, I can take that into the real world and create an experiment and test it out. And then I will learn things and things will be wrong and I'll be confused again. And then I can explore that creatively and, and try to resolve that that confusion. That cycle I find um, has has made me much more effective um, as a writer and a scientist. I have confusions I run into every day in the practice of being in the world that I then really need that outlet to understand and explore. Well, this sounds like very much a mirror of our beloved Leonardo Guillermo del Toro. The filmmaker said that he had this chance to interrogate the universe. And that doesn't mean that the question, the answers that the universe gives you back are are the are the answers uh, per se. And so we will uh, liberate you uh, right now uh, to go back and do the things that Leonardo did uh, to try to forge these connections. And we're so grateful for the time you've given us and the spectacular answers to, uh, to our, our questions about Leonardo and creativity and science. Thank you so much, Dr. Gawande. Thank you for your film. 